The lab we're doing today is lab number nine, groundwater. So on the very first page of our lab book, there's a diagram. And this diagram shows a typical hydrological cycle. We've seen these when we talked about the lectures on water. And so we have ocean evaporation at 450,000 cubic kilometers. And that shows that by number one, as that warm, moist air rises, it's going to condense, cool, form clouds, and the resultant precipitation. So precipitation over the land is 175,000 cubic kilometers. And then evaporation over the landscape is 50,000 cubic kilometers. Precipitation at 175,000, number three. There's spring um, return, so springs are discharging water. That is at 10,000 cubic kilometers. Surface runoff, this is when it rains, this is water that runs straight off into the ocean at 24,000 kilometers. And then there's infiltration that goes into the ground in the deep aquifers. There's a shallow and a deep aquifer. Generally, the deep aquifer, once water enters that aquifer, it does not basically return to the system unless there's a major earthquake. Sometimes water has been brought up along faults on major earthquakes. Or if humans do very deep drilling. So this is the hydrological cycle. And we've seen this before. And so we're going to use this information here to answer questions on the next page. So on the next page, these questions here deal specifically with water. So it says use figure one to answer the following questions. So question number one says what happens to the water entering the deep aquifer? Kind of already answered that. Once water enters the deep aquifer, it basically stays there. Now humans have the technology to drill wells and to extract that water. And it's kind of controversial. This is very old bodies of water. It's considered to be fossil water. And sometimes when we remove this water, it impacts the overall water system by compressing land, by a process called subsidence when things when landscapes actually sink. So the answer to question number one is what happens to the water entering the aquifer? It basically stays there until humans remove it. So I've written all the answers here on the board and let's go through these. So question number one. What happens to the water that goes into the aquifer? Basically it stays in the aquifer until it's removed by humans. Question number two deals with evaporation over the land versus evaporation over the oceans. So the question basically asks how much more evaporation occurs over the oceans or over the land. So land evaporation is 50,000 cubic kilometers. And that number was obtained from the lab manual that shows the land evaporation at 50,000 cubic kilometers. So according to the diagram, does more water evaporate from the land or the oceans? And by what amount? So we have land evaporation at 50,000 kilometers. And then we have an additional 40,000, which is called evapotranspiration. And so evapotranspiration is animals that sweat, we sweat, and as we sweat, we emit moisture into the atmosphere. Plants do the same thing. So if you take the total evaporation of the land of 50,000 kilometers, add the evapotranspiration to it, that gives a total of 90,000 kilometers evaporating over land. Oceans consist of 450,000 cubic kilometers so you take the 450,000 minus the 90,000 that comes off the land, so that's evaporation on land and evapotranspiration, and that basically means that 360,000 more kilometers, cubic kilometers of water evaporates from the oceans than the lands. So that's basically the answer to number two.
Number three, ask approximately what percent, and again, I'm using this diagram, number three, so it says approximately what percent of water evaporated into the atmosphere came from the oceans. So it's an easy equation we use. Percent from the oceans equals ocean evaporation divided by total evaporation times 100. So I did this here, number three, what percent from the oceans. Ocean evaporation consists of 450,000 cubic kilometers. Total evaporation consists of the 450,000 cubic kilometers from the ocean plus the 50,000 cubic kilometers from evaporation over the land plus the 40,000 cubic kilometers of evapotranspiration that's from plants and animals. So I you do the number, the math there, the division, we get 0.83, move the decimal over by two or times it by 100, and that means 83.33% more water evaporates from the oceans than over the lands, and that's our final answer. Question number four says, is the amount of evaporation in the oceans greater than the return? So what's returning to the ocean is gonna be runoff. So this is when it rains, this is water that basically does not infiltrate into the ground. It doesn't get trapped into lakes. It runs into, from, from the surface into streams and eventually out into the ocean again. So that's called runoff and that consists of 24,000 cubic kilometers. And then there are springs that are discharging at 10,000 cubic kilometers. And both of these figures I got from figure one on the first page. And so ocean evaporation is 450,000 cubic kilometers minus the uh, 34,000 cubic kilometers, which means the oceans have a net loss of 416,000 cubic kilometers. So in other words, 416,000 more cubic kilometers evaporates from the oceans than is returned. So there's only 34,000 is returned and 416,000 is lost. So that's our final answer, 416,000. All right, the next part of this lab has to do with groundwater. So we're gonna look at two important concepts here. So permeability and porosity. So at the very top on page 63, it says water entering the ground takes advantage of porosity. This is pore space. This allows water to be absorbed. And then permeability is the ability of rock units, soil units, geological units to transmit water. That means allow the water to flow through it. So both permeability and porosity varies depending on the soil and the rock types. And the final experiments, we're gonna use two glass beakers filled with sediments and material consisting of gravel, sand, clay, and we're gonna actually pour water through those two beakers, and we're gonna look at how the rates of flow vary. So number one, it says below, draw a sequence of sedimentary material from the bottom to the top of the beaker and label each unit as sand, gravel, or clay. So once you've done that, so you're gonna go down here to the bottom and you're gonna draw the units. I did kind of just a poor job of drawing this just to illustrate to you how big this should be. It should be something fairly large. I'm actually going to use the two diagrams that I drew on the board. This will give us better clarity. So I've drawn these two units and this is what you need to draw on for beaker A. Draw your beaker and label the units. The very top unit is organic material soil Underlying that is a gray sandstone. Then we have a hematitic sandstone, another gray sandstone, and the last at the bottom, we have a conglomerate. So this is how your drawing of Beaker A should look like at this point. We're gonna do the same thing through Beaker B. Beaker B, a little bit different geology, at the very top, we have a conglomerate. 
Then we have a gray sandstone. Then there's a white shell, a hematitic sandstone, and a gray sandstone. So these are your units. So record those on your lab for beaker A and for beaker B. Make them big. Now, reading through this, it says add 50 millimeters of red water and track the movement of the water and record its progress. I'm going to do that on the board. After two minutes, add an additional 40 millimeters of red water and record the progress of the water. Continue to add water every two minutes until you've used 500 millimeters of red water. Observe the flow of the red water and the depth it reaches. Number six, does the water penetrate all layers? Seven, what layers of material does the water travel the quickest and the slowest? And be specific, such as white sand, fine gravel, coarse gravel, etc. Sketch the diagram of the layers labeling each unit below and how the water reacts with each unit. So like I said, I'm going to do this on the board because it's going to give us a little bit greater um, overall idea. So what we're going to do is I have two beakers, and this is what these beakers look like. This is beaker A, and this is as I've labeled it on the board. And this is Beaker B. Beaker B, we're going to pour green water through that one. Beaker A is the red water. So I'm going to start here by looking at Beaker A. This is our red water beaker. If I can get my uh, camera to cooperate. It would be so nice to have somebody in here with me to actually help me with cameras and stuff, but we're not allowed to bring anybody else in the building. It's very restricted. Kind of a pain, but that's the way it goes. Alright, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add my 50 millimeters of red water, pour it into a small beaker, And then we're going to track the movement of that water. So here we go. My hands will be red by the time this is done. So I pour that water in there. And notice that the water is kind of taking its time getting through this first unit here. You can see a wetting front where it is wetting around. So the water's traveling along. And it's going through this fairly slowly. So what does this say for this first unit that we're looking at? Actually on this side here it's beginning to track now a little bit quicker. And over here you can see it's really moving through a lot quickly. So it's gone on to the, from the unit. So it kind of slowed down here and then when it hit this um, gray sandstone it moved very quickly. It traveled through that very quickly, this gray sandstone. So what does that say? What is the difference between this organic material, which for all purposes we can say is a soil, and the gray sandstone? So the water kind of slowed down through this. So I'm going to record this and I'm going to have to do all, most waters. This water is going to be in blue because I don't have a red marker. So through this organic material, the water went very kind of slowly. And then it went through the uh, gray material. And even through the hematitic sandstone, it kind of went quickly. So this is how I'm recording this on the board. And I'm also keeping track of my time. 
So the very top here, notice that I have a wide line here. This indicates that the water moved fairly slowly through this organic material. And then once it hit the gray sandstone and the hematitic sandstone, it moved very quickly. So what that tells us is that the organic material has high, a very high rate of porosity. High rate of porosity and a lower rate of permeability. The gray sandstone and the hematitic sandstones, both of those being sandstones, both of those have a higher rate of permeability, which means they allow the water to move through it quicker. And we're coming up on our time to do our second dose of water. So here we go. Right at the top of the second. I'm going to be a little bit, a couple 15 seconds over, but that's okay. It's better to spend more time on the water between waters than rushing it, because if you put too much water in it all at once, uh, air gets trapped in there and it stops the water from flowing. So here we go. This is our second volume of water. And we can see that now the hematitic sandstone seems to be absorbing an awful lot of the um, water. So let me move this around a little bit here. And you can see that there's areas like here. This is where the soil is basically storing the water. It's not allowing this water down into that sandstone unit yet. And we see this certainly occurring here. So this top unit definitely has a very high rate of porosity. So porosity means the ability to store water. And this is certainly storing water. Once it breached through and got through this gray sandstone, and then once it hit the hematitic sandstone, again, the hematitic sandstone is kind of, it's absorbing water a little bit more than the gray sandstone. So the hematitic sandstone is certainly absorbing more water than the gray. And I'm going to get ready here to pour the third um, So at the top here, we see a little bit of pooling of water. The water's beginning to pool. That means this is really soaking up the water and it's not allowing it to flow through it. So this is what you want in a paper towel. You want lots of porosity. You want that paper towel to suck up that water. You don't want permeability because then it will just run through the paper towel. So when they advertise the quicker picker upper, they're really advertising paper towels that have a greater amount of porosity and not permeability. So remember, permeability, this allows water to flow through it quickly. Now notice that the sandstone, the hematitic sandstone, is really absorbing a lot of this water. It's not quite letting it get down, but it is a little bit into the uh, gray sandstone below. But look up here. This white here is not even saturated. And this hematitic sandstone is really sucking up the water all the way around. So the hematitic sandstone has just a little bit more porosity. So I'm going to change my little diagram here, and I'll show you in a second that what I, how I changed it. So I'd say the hematitic sandstone has a little bit more porosity and less permeability than the gray sandstone. And I'll bring the camera around and show you that. So this is the modification that I made. So you can see that the overlying gray sandstone 
has greater permeability and less porosity. So the thicker, the fatter the lines, the more porosity. That means they're absorbing the water. It's slowing it down. The thinner the line, that makes it, that's basically saying that this is the, where it has more permeability. It allows the water to flow through it quicker. I know those words sound the same. All right, I think we're about ready to throw, put in our next unit of water. Look at, we're actually saturating down here. So actually we are due in like 10 seconds. And again, we got a lot of pooling at the very top. Let's see if we can see water moving through this. That sandstone is absorbing that. Look, all the way around this sandstone, this hematitic sandstone. The overlying sandstone is just allowing the water to pass through it for the most part. But the hematitic sandstone, is it's just sucking it up. And it's slowing it down from reaching the underlying unit. In fact, it's almost saturated all the way around that hematitic sandstone. Okay, so we have another minute before we can add our next volume of water. Looks like this water is going to definitely penetrate all the way down through all the units. It's pretty now close, to, you know, it's really absorbing this. So underneath this is a conglomerate with some sand mixed in with it. Okay, pouring more water on. Look at the water fill up that right there. So it completely fill up this. The hematitic sandstone that this is wet all the way around. And so is the overlying um, gray sandstone unit. And water is making its way all the way down, almost down to the conglomerate. Maybe in this next application of water, we will see penetration of the water all the way down to the bottom. So this gray sandstone that's above the conglomerate isn't absorbing as much of the water, but it is kind of absorbing it. And it is kind of slowing it down from, from reaching that very bottom conglomerate unit. And we'll be pouring our next unit and we'll see what happens next. So here we go. So it seems as if it's kind of slowing down from reaching the bottom. Upper units are all saturated. We still don't have water going all the way to the bottom, to the conglomerate. This um, gray sandstone that lies above the conglomerate seems to be really starting to absorb water. So this unit seems to have an awful lot of um, porosity to it. It's allowing that water to uh, kind of slow down quite a bit. It's really absorbing 
the water and it's not allowing it to go to the bottom unit at all. In fact, it's basically saturating all the way around. Even though it's at the bottom or near the bottom and the other units above it have a chance to absorb the water before this one does, this one is actually absorbing water all the way around. And it did more so than the, than the overlying units. So this particular sandstone here is a little bit more coarser grain than the other gray sandstone. So I ran these things through a sieve and this was a little bit more coarser grain. So coarser grain material, a little bit more space in between the grains is going to result in a little bit more ability for water to be stored. And that certainly is more porosity. So I definitely would draw this porosity a little bit wider on this particular uh, gray sandstone because it's really absorbing. And then we'll see what happens when we get to the um, bottom of the conglomerate. See, we'll see how this conglomerate reacts. So I think I'm ready to pour more water here in about five seconds. So here we go, more water. The rate is really slowed down. Water tends to be pooling at the top. So this gray sandstone unit is absorbing all the water and it's not even allowing any of it to get down to the conglomerate. So this really has a high rate of um, permeability. Very slow porosity. And we'll be pouring more water here in a few seconds. See if we get down to the bottom. Once that gray sandstone unit becomes saturated, it's, it's going to have no other choice but to release some of the water to the lower unit, the conglomerate. So more water. It looks like that sandstone unit is pretty much absorbed a gray sandstone unit all the way around. So you can see the conglomerate here. It's not even letting water get to the conglomerate yet. Which is pretty uh, neat really. So you can see this conglomerate just really isn't seeing much of anything yet. It's really slowing down the water. You can see it moving a little bit there now. But our conglomerate basically has been void of any uh, water at this point in time. It's kind of weird how that's working. I'm trying to shake the top here a little bit to keep the uh, air bubbles from... Well, looks like we got some finally. So look at... Finally, there's penetration at the very bottom. Look at that. I do have some air bubbles that are trapping some of the water, too. You can see the air bubbles moving up here. And so now water has really made it all the way to the bottom. And at the top here, we're, pretty, we're pulling up pretty badly. So the water's basically, it's being slowed down because of this huge sandstone unit, this gray sandstone unit, which is 
the second from the bottom has really slowed things down. And there's a big air bubble that's escaped. You can see that. Wow. Huge air bubble just escaped. Made a nasty little trail. And so, yeah, we have saturation. But this area here still isn't quite saturated yet. I don't want to try and shake some of the air bubbles out. There's a bunch of them trapped right here. You can see some air. And that's stopping the water from... And notice how quickly it went through the conglomerate. It kind of went through this conglomerate real quickly. I mean, you can, so this basically is a unit that has high permeability. So I'm going to finish up the drawing here, and then I'll show you what I've drawn. So I would say the conglomerate has the greatest permeability. And so to answer the question is, does the water penetrate all the layers? And we definitely would say yes to that. And this is how I draw my diagram showing my permeability and porosity. So the conglomerate at the bottom, that has the greatest amount of permeability. The water went through that really quickly, super quick. The gray sandstone probably has the largest amount of porosity of any unit here. There's a gray unit that's above or just below the uh, organic and above the hematitic sandstone. That is a different size grain. So what I did is I took this sand and I sieved it through these different sieves. And so the gray sandstone that's just below the organic material, that is more of a fine grain sandstone. The gray sandstone that is just above the conglomerate is a coarser grain sandstone, and that allowed that sandstone to have a greater amount of porosity. So the unit that probably has the greatest amount of porosity is going to be the gray sandstone. The unit that has the greatest amount of permeability, the ability of water to flow through it, is going to be the conglomerate. And then second would be the organic material. So that concludes Beaker A. Now we're going to move on to Beaker B, and this is where we're going to run green water through. We have slightly different units. We have a conglomerate unit at the top. It's a very, very coarse conglomerate. I mean, this is gravel sized material. Very fine grained sandstone. And so this fine grained sandstone should have a high rate of porosity. And then a white shell is very fine. The hemicentic sandstone is basically the same type of sandstone that we put in Beaker A. And then the gray sandstone at the bottom is a very coarse sandstone. So that is a sandstone that has potential of very high porosity. The hematitic sandstone above it will probably have a high rate of high rate of permeability. It'll allow water flow through that hematitic sandstone quicker. The gray sandstone is going to really absorb that sand that, that water. So let's switch out beakers here. And we're going to now go to a green beaker, a green water beaker. So you can see the units here. At the very top, there's a conglomerate. Then there's a fine grain sandstone, gray sandstone. Then a white shell, a hematitic sandstone, and a little bit more coarser sandstone at the bottom. So these are our units. And I'm going to try to raise the camera up just a little bit here. And with this one here, we're going to pour in green water. And we're going to track the green water. Okay, get 
really important our first thing of green water. And I'm actually going to move the camera to the top so you can actually see this. So obviously this is a very coarse conglomerate. So this conglomerate is very coarse. Gravel sized material. So we know the water is going to flow through this super fast. So here we go. So there it goes. Boom. Right through it. So this upper conglomerate, this has a very high rate of permeability. This allows the water to move right through it. And now it's being slowed down by our sandstone unit below, the gray sandstone. And you can see that the gray sandstone has a higher degree of porosity, lower permeability. It's slowing down the water. The overlying conglomerate allows the water to move through it very quickly. Just boom, right through it, real fast. And so I'm going to record the conglomerate as really high rate of uh, permeability and extremely low porosity. The gray sandstone looks like it's going to have a high rate of porosity because it's absorbing the water all the way around it. So it's, it's saturating the top before it allows that water to go through the bottom. All right, getting ready for our second dose of water. And again, see how quickly it goes through the conglomerate? You can actually see the bubbles being displaced, the air. It's going through it very quickly. And the gray sandstone unit is really soaking up this water here. And it looks like the water's made it all the way through the sandstone here. And it's now beginning to contact the shale unit. So the green water has made it all the way through the um, sandstone unit. So that sandstone unit kind of has both high permeability and porosity. So it's able to absorb a lot of water and it's able to actually move water. This would be a perfect sandstone to act as a reservoir for oil. So if you're an oil man, you would love to find a sandstone like this because this is, this is the unit that's going to basically allow that oil to flow through it and also store it. This is like the dream rock. So now to pour some more green water in. And look how fast it goes through that uh, conglomerate. Very quickly through the conglomerate. Kind of slows down when it hits the, um, the sandstone unit. And you can see the water's made it all the way through that gray sandstone. So our um, gray sandstone unit is pretty much saturated all the way around. There is some air in there. Create a micro earthquake so we can get the air out. Getting ready to pour some more water here in about 15 seconds. There we go. What's happening now? Notice the conglomerate 
is becoming saturated now. So the conglomerate unit is definitely becoming saturated. The waters begin to pull up. The sandstone unit, completely wet all the way around. And yet when I poured that water through this conglomerate, it actually started to pull up. It's going to be interesting to see what happens when we um, add the next volume of water. So in about 15 seconds or so, and here we are, we're going to pour some more water. In fact, I'm actually going to do this. Let you see what it looks like when I'm pouring the water to the top of this. So see how it's pulling up there? And notice that the conglomerate is completely saturated. Our water is not going anywhere, it's just sitting there. And so water is penetrated all the way down through the gray sandstone. But it's not penetrating this white shale. Not penetrating this white shale at all. So what does that tell us about the white shale? The white shale has no Porosity. It has no permeability. It's basically dead with respect to transmitting water. And look, our water just doesn't go anywhere. It's just sitting there. If I add more water to this thing, guess what's going to happen? It's going to overflow. So this unit here, this white shell, has no permeability, it has no porosity, and basically it's not allowing the water to penetrate it at all. Even if I shake the air bubbles out. So on this one here, does the water penetrate all the layers? No. It will not penetrate this white shell. So this white shell has no permeability, no porosity. So how you're going to draw that is, this is what it's going to look like. So here's your conglomerate. High rate of uh, permeability. Allow the water to go right through it. Boom. The gray sandstone kind of slowed things down. It had a little bit higher rate of um, porosity, not as quick permeability. And then we get to the white shell, and nothing happens. So this is how you're going to draw your diagram. So does the water penetrate all the layers in Baker B? No. So this is how you want to draw your beaker for B. This is what beaker A is going to look like. Water did penetrate all the units in Baker A. It did not penetrate all the units in Baker B. So there's a final question we have to ask ourselves. And given these two reservoirs, or these two um, geological units, A and B, 
A allowed water to go all the way down through everything. Pretty much what's everything. Unit B does not. So on the question here, it says, you have been hired to construct a landfill for miscible residential waste. This waste contains household waste such as small batteries, unused detergent, cosmetics, hairspray, and beauty products, and food waste. Many household products may contaminate groundwater aquifers. Of the two geological sequences you observed in beakers A and B, which one would be the best and why? So obviously, if you're building a landfill, you don't want water to contaminate the lower aquifers. So in landfills today, before they construct a landfill, back in the good old days, as they say, they would basically dig a hole in the ground and they'd throw everybody's trash in there. And they would bury it out of sight, out of mind. Not quite. Unfortunately, when it rains, water infiltrates into the ground and it picks up all sorts of contaminants from all that waste that we threw away. So today, we actually take landfills and we line them with clay. And this particular clay right here is called bentonite. Very fine grain, has no permeability, has no porosity, and we line landfills with this to keep the water in the landfill rather than have that water go into the aquifer. So Beaker B is the one that you would definitely chose, and you would line your landfill with this bentonite clay and so this clay is not going to allow the water to go through it. We can let this thing sit here for a week, and it still won't penetrate. So that basically ends this lab. So you'll use all the data that I presented here and the drawings that you produced. There will be specific questions on permeability and porosity in particular units. So you have the video at your disposal. You can play it. You can pause it. Definitely write all this stuff out in your lab manual and then use the lab manual when you go into Canvas and answer the lab quiz questions. So that concludes this lab.